I'm a Pommy, this is a podcast. Welcome to the show. Before we start, a big shout out to our venue sponsors, the London Hotel. Make sure you come down any day of the week. It's a good night here. Come up on the weekends. Fridays, they're doing $10 cocktails. Pop on down for that. And lastly, if you need any of my services, any situation with your home loan, refinancing, restructuring, uh, equity releases, investment properties, anything like that, hit the link in the description and get in touch. My guest today, Jeffrey. How you doing, mate? Bank robber turned 18 years in prison and turned lifestyle coach, motivator. I would have never expected it when I first met you, mate. Yes. You're a new a, man. It's been a journey, been a total journey and... Uh, I even talk to myself differently. Conversations are different <coughs> and life's different at this point in time. And yeah, yeah. Um, it's you know, been a good journey. And it's one that people can take hope from because if I could do it, why can't you? Yeah, around any format of life. Mm. Um, we've all, you know, so many people live within a prison of their own mindset in this day and age and they're you know, stuck in a bedroom. And I think that's one of the most important things these types of podcasts bring out to the world. People like myself sitting in a bedroom lacking hope sitting in a cell lacking hope and we step into a different way of life and as i said if i can do it why can't you man yeah exactly like i, I think podcasting and long long form conversations like this it gives you know role uh, an opportunity for people that don't have good role models now can access good role models through you know Absolutely. youtube for free or Absolutely. spotify or whatever it is and i love that <coughs> back in the day <laughs> It was who you knew from the area, and from our area, we had no role models. So, um, well, I shouldn't say that. Our role models were destructive and, and yeah, dysfunctional, yeah. and we just went down the same path. Let's go into that for a bit. So, your background, what, is lo- what was it like growing up for young Jeffrey, you know, growing up in the household with your parents and, and, and just losing that lack of direction, I suppose? I think they, you know, I shared this many a time before, but my parents, they were just in a process of um, finding themselves. And, and my mother had come through the stolen generation, Aboriginal, um, had the hard upbringing, and then met my father in a nightclub, um, German Austrian and Aboriginal um, mother. So that combination, you know, I think whatever happened in and amongst that, unfortunately, they end up adopting out my younger. Um, brother, which I never knew about until um, she had cancer and one day they did out the bone marrow and I basically found out I had another brother. Wow. Crazy story. And then he comes up, he fires up, they tell me not to ring him. At that point in time, I'm a well-known bank robber. I'm like, just give me the number, I'm ringing, I'm doing what I want. Yeah. Um, I say, end up in an argument with the missus at the time, uh, leave the house, tell him to stay. I ring him up the next morning, you ready to go, come meet your mum and um, he tells me, hey, mum, how are you? Um, oh, I think, you know, um, Jeff's wanted or something of that nature. Uh, the police are here looking for him. <laughs> so that was my introduction oh, to my brother. Mate. Like, I think they just <clears throat> went through this period where they were in survival mode. Um, my parents weren't uh, of a background where there was a lot of money. Uh, there was a lot of role modelling. My father left Austria um, when he was a young kid, came over here as a baker and... Yeah, I just had a crack at life and the old hard-working mentality back then. And I imagine your dad would have been... Well, did he come here just after World War? Exactly. So yeah. he had that disciplinary type of German mentality. And Same as what Schwarzenegger talks about that in his book, uh, his Austrian parents. It is, man. <laughs> and like I, I literally look at his... I read his book when I was a young kid because yeah, yeah, I yeah. wanted the six-pack and... His book was huge. I read back it then. as well. The big and black, yeah, yeah, yeah the I read black it. Yeah, cover, yeah. So. I used to do the work, the competition workout. <laughs> Four sets of ten pull-ups was his warm-up. I was like, "How oh, am I going to fucking do this, <laughs> mate?" In jail, it's like, mate, four sets of a hundred. <laughs> you just and it's ridiculous to, the bugs that are in there. But going back to the parents, you know, they just did their best with what they had, um, and their level of knowledge, education proximity to those that were in a, a better way of life wasn't available and they passed on what they had to me and unfortunately there was a lot of um toing and froing they were arguing quite a lot i saw a lot of that um some physical stuff in amongst that and that transferred to me and 10 years of age i'm out at redfern street and never forget um both my parents asking me who did i want to live with and i was like i want to live with you both you know as a young 10 year old kid would and 
um, it's just a big, didn't uh, concept question grab- to ask a ten year old. That's crazy, eh? Like, and that's probably that sums up my parents at that point in time and the level of maturity in amongst their relationship to be able to ask a ten year old kid and let him decide. I think just it's insane. So, um, yeah, I look back. They taught me great lessons in amongst that as well. So as much as I, I sit here and say that, I don't knock them too on that. I, I do say that. And this is for every human. We operate from a level or operating system based on the knowledge, experience, education that we have in proximity to ourselves. And my parents gave me everything they had, but it wasn't at the level, you know, where I'm living here in Paddington, in, which is more an affluent sort of suburb in Sydney. So it's important to understand who you're around and the importance of making sure that if you are trying to strive in life, you're around the right people to mm. make that happen. And, you know, if your parents aren't that, means that you need to be the cycle break and become somebody different and learn something totally different yeah we talked about this on another podcast where um we were basically saying you know if you get to the age where most people have left university is around the age of 21 to 23 years old you've really got no fucking excuse then absolutely you all of that stuff happened to you and you're an adult now it's your job to make your future this and anything, any baggage or all the other stuff, you kind of like need someone to have the reset button and be like, this is it now. Like the rest is on you. Like it's not on anyone else, you know? Absolutely. <coughs> I, I call it, and we do it with our business, road mapping your life, you know, yeah. and a lot of <coughs> businesses would do a business plan, right? This pub would have a business plan. And the idea and marketing plan, events plan and all of the above, but mm. in life, what happens, we get the 23 We've been shut down by our parents. Maybe you've been shut down by your partner. Oh, I don't know if you could do that. It's pretty hard because both of you have never done that before. I came from parents of that nature where they'd not done or started a business, not done a bachelor's degree. So for me to go out and do this, Mm. I already had so much, so many people, the police, the government, my school, my parents, my everybody in my circle telling me it's not possible. You can't do that. You can't, you can't, you can't. Then I realized when I stepped away and I talked to these corporates, athletes, soldiers, they were in the same position. They go through life, their parents don't do that. Or they'll tell you to do something that they've never done themselves. And even as a kid, you pick up on your parents aren't doing it themselves, but they're telling you to act that way. It's like, well, wait a second, you're not doing that. Mm. Um, why should I do why that? Why should I do it? And, yeah. and that's what <clears throat> ends up happening. We end up with this boundary or our egos, that boundary, and that stops us from stepping into the greatest version of ourselves. And out of there version of life and you know for me unfortunately i stepped into a different um pathway stepped out of that um path of my father and mother and said i'm going to be something different went out onto the streets and that's where you know the shift you were you were 12 years old when you left home right crazy 12 years old yeah and what was the what was the what was the catalyst moment when you were like fuck this i'm going I think probably wanting to fight my dad and I, I stood up to him. I was 12 years old. I was getting physically abused. When I say that, like if I'd come home, I look back on it now and I've thought about this recently. He was like saying, I want you to do good in life. This Don't worry about these other kids. This area is, you've got to be different to everybody else. And demanding that out of myself, rugby league, soccer, I did really well and went to, down to the Institute of Sport. Johnny Warren Soccer Academy, these types of things when, when I was a young kid. But what ended up happening is, you know, it just got to a point where I thought, I felt scared from him to the point where one day, I, you know, many a time, I'd say to my mate, punch me in the eye. And he's like, what do you mean? I said, punch me, I'm going to punch you. Because I'd rather get punched in the eye from a younger kid my age that gives me a black eye than go home and come out with all welts across my body the next day. So... That's how I, I got to a point where I stood up to my dad. I thought I was big enough, old enough, 12 years of yeah, age. you think you are at that point. I got yeah. s- absolutely poleaxed <clears throat> around and um, I said, nah, that's it, I'm done. And um, the school, Randwick Boys High School, I think I'd gone back to home. I'd got locked up, come back out. I might have been 14, 15 or something at this stage. Um, so I'd run away, come back for a short period and then I jumped out and legged it again because... Um, I'd gone to school and I was literally just black and blue and, and um, coppers ended up showing up and I said, oh no, we're playing tackle footy on the weekend and they're like, that's not from tackle footy. I was like, yes it is. So I just went, it's not the environment for me to, how, how do you thrive in that environment? 
Yeah. How do you honestly try and get the most out of a gig? Try to just get away. That's with walking it. in the house, you know, hunkered over, scared that if Shooting you say yourself. the wrong thing, you know, <clears throat> it's just crazy. Yeah, I had a little bit of that. Like I had my well, my dad stopped stopped coming to pick me up when I was about twelve, and then my mum was with a guy who was a bit narcissistic, very controlling, wow. and um, I would just pander to whatever he wanted me to do Absolutely. just to just avoid conflict i'd be Absolutely. like nah. like if he was like go and do this i'd just be like all right i'll go and do it and in my brain i was just like just when you're 18 years old you can leave the house and do what you want and da, 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 da. but like Talk there's so many through. kids that are like going through this um like now like mm. they're they're, they're going through it they've got poor role models um and they can't see or feel like they navigate well and then unfortunately they do what you know what you've rebel. done in the past and you, you rebel and then you end up going towards something where you feel like you're part of a group Absolutely. or part now of you're a, validated right yeah. so the criminal world for me was my validation and i only <coughs> went into that because i just wanted food man i was starving like anybody any human being it, like you look at the wars going on in the world at this point in time those that have been displaced will go to a place where they can find food water shelter or whatever it may be right mm. and that's what i did as a young kid and i realized that there was a lot of good qualities that my father instilled similar to what i just heard from yourself mm. that discipline for you i discipline, know yeah. became a part of yourself just knowing you, a bit of your story and the same thing for me that stuck with me forever because as much as i was like oh i don't want to do the dishes or i don't want to set the table it was a dis. Don't make my bed every morning. I mm. just want to rebel. Take your shoes off. Yeah, all that yeah, sort yeah. of stuff, right? So <clears throat> by doing that, I just became disciplined, and it was a normal part of me, and that stuck with me forever. So I'm great. Like as much as I say, my dad was physically abusive. I don't ever feel that he did, or I don't think he started in a position where he had bad intention for me. We were saying, oh, you know, I'm going to smash you and I'm the boss of the house. His mentality was, I'm going to keep you so disciplined that you don't hang around the wrong kids and you end up on the right path for life and you end up in a different position to these kids that are going down the wrong path. So I think that was his mentality looking back on it all now. And I think the more he did it, the more, I don't know, control he sort of felt, I felt. And that's where that crossroads came to a head and I hung jump out that window and that was it never went back where did you end up living after that man wherever i could find a place i'd so I'd surfing couch or? yeah you know the old couch surf. hey what are you at? what's happening here and then pretend to fall asleep at four o'clock in the afternoon just so i could and someone would say i oh, just leave him there let him sleep he's right or you know where's your parents and people would ask that, that question um friends of the area knew how my father was so some of the mothers would let me stay at their house friends that i was growing up with but dad was coming there knocking on doors trying to find me so i ended up getting out of the area sleeping under a bridge for a long time when i first started um and then i shifted out of that because i woke up feeling like someone was touching me and i was like what the heck and i looked up and the monster rat was <laughs> looking me in the eye i had that experience twice in my life it happened again when i was in Parramatta jail at 18 years of age um and i was in a cell with a bloke who had hiv we were on muster, we were about to go in. So muster, they read out your name, Morgan, yep. And you yep. walk in, you get locked in at three o'clock at Parramatta, maximum security. And just as we're about to walk in, the boys grabbed me and said, Morgs, you're crazy, man. And I was like, why is that? I go, do you know, he's got HIV, he's pretty nuts. Like he's done this, that and the other. Mm. And I was like, why didn't you tell me this before? Yeah, yeah, muster, yeah, 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 yeah. Anyway, we walk in and sure enough, um, I wake up, there's some rustling around and all of a sudden I see him with a syringe full of blood and I'm like, what the heck, what are you doing, mate? He goes, oh, so sorry, I was trying to use drugs where you wouldn't see it, brother. I don't want to, um, you know, show, show you the wrong way of life. And weirdly enough, in a cell where he'd obviously taken a, a crazy path himself. And then I just sort of turned an eye to it. Later on, woke up and felt like he was touching me, but it was another rat and just flung it off the Fuck. top bunk. and. <laughs> Great, great times, great man. <laughs> <laughs> Five star rating. I wish there was uh, some yeah, recommend back it. Book then. yourself. Book yourself a night stay there. <laughs> you can actually do ghost tours at Parramatta Jail now these days. Yeah. I haven't done it, but I wouldn't mind going back into that jail 
even doing podcasts here. Mate, they used to say to us in the military, civilians will pay for this. And you're like, this is shit. Why the fuck would civilians pay for this? But they do. They, they do. pay to go in prisons. They pay to do a day's worth of military style training. Crazy. Or whatever yeah. it is. And you're like, oh, I'm never doing that again. Oh, yeah. Oh, dear. So you, you obviously you're going through this like phase of displacement. Absolutely. When do you get into the, the wrong crowd? I'd say not long after. Like, I'd gotten into, I just, yeah, gravitated, things happen. Uh, what I I found these red frogs, this money in the red frogs. Then I started my own little journey breaking into shops to get more money because I realised money was left in the shops. Then I was working out different ways of doing that and just being on the streets at night, I ended up bumping into other kids down the same path. And mm. you know, they want to do the same thing, find a bed for the night. I do not even know, and someone's asked me many times and I've been thinking about it, trying to rack my memory as to how we got the hotel room because this day and age you need ID. Probably back then you didn't, I don't know, man, but we just, yeah, and you get nice hotels. Um, back then 250 bucks was pretty decent for a nice room and I'd be at the Hilton or something mm. laying up as a young kid and it just I don't even know how I got in there at 14, 16 years of age and you know, it's not just me but our whole crew and we did that on a regular basis and um, it was So you all just strange. chipped in to get the night there? <laughs> yeah, and we just got better and better and our crew became very famous um, I suppose for the wrong reasons and more people gravitated towards us so I had more options it's like business, right? If you're doing well in business, someone comes in, same principle, I look at it now, and same, you know, we was, I was just networking, and this person who was great at, in your world, financing, next one's at trades, next mm. one's at stocks, next one's at Bitcoin or whatever it may be, same principle around that. This person could turn off alarm, this person could, you know, go through the roof of a place, this person stole luxury cars, and that's the path I and took. And you build your crew through that. And that was it, you know, and... It was just walking those streets at night. Um, and you don't have family, you've displaced, you know, as you said, and you just someone shows you five minutes of love, man, and you haven't had that for a long time, you'll reach out and do that. And, you know, I, I realise that that's what happens in relationships. People don't feel loved. Another person injects themselves, you look beautiful, love how your hair's looking or whatever yeah, it may be. Suddenly the conversation <coughs> starts and now they feel that love and they take a step out of their marriage or relationship. And for me as a young kid, you're not equipped and, and mature enough to understand that. So uh, you just step into this path and say, let's hang and let's let's roll. And i got your back, you got mine. And the rest was history. Our crew rolled out for 20 plus years together, I think 30 plus probably. Um, which was very rare in the criminal world because you always have someone dobbing you in, someone stealing your girlfriend, someone you know, doing something uh, untoward to break the group up. But we, we stuck together as a crew for a long, long time. Talk to me about the planning behind a bank robbery. It's pretty crazy, man. Like, for us, we were, we were pretty, like, I'll talk about the last one as an example. Um, we drove down to Melbourne, pretty long drive for those that don't know, Sydney to Melbourne, it's about a seven, eight hour drive, I think it's an eight hour drive. Yeah. A lot of conversations obviously about um, the types of cars, getting into factories, turning off the alarms in the factory, taking the car, making sure no one noticed that it's gone until the next day. So you can go and park it, you'd park it, you know, um, in a spot that uh, wouldn't raise suspicion more richer area yeah. try and put in a visitor's car park or something of that nature um, and then you know you go into these um, scenarios I'd drive the route back then different routes um, what about if you have to turn left here it's like a military operation yeah literally <coughs> so that was how I operated personally and there was not many that would do that but I just figured you know to the point even you look at how I'm built as a on a body level um, I was running on a regular basis, I'd run with a big backpack. Um, so, I, you know, if I if I was going to do something and I had to run with the bag, well, then I, I might as well make sure that I could actually run get with that, that bag. Yeah. Yeah. And could I jump the fence with the bag? What type of bag would it get caught on the fence? Like, I, I was... Everything I could think of, I'd put money in the soles of my shoes. So if I got rid of the bag I had some form had of money on yeah. myself no ID other than the money under the sole of my foot and that would just get me a cab to safety um, fake IDs fake ho you know, booked into hotels and all of the above so um, for us it was pretty complex mate we stashed the last one stashed a sledgehammer um, 
the police say that we were the sledgehammer gang. We smash open a open a vault. Vault, vault was always open in the day, so it looks shut, but you just open it up and then you'd smash open the safe inside that. Um, this day and age, there's not enough cash, and hence why I share that sort of little journey. So people, because people are intrigued, people are interested, and um, you get in there, and once you started sledgehammering that the inside the actual safe, the vault part, uh, or inside the vault on the safe part, um, it wouldn't take long, it would bust open and yeah. whatever was in there was in there and it was a mixed bag and, um, you yeah, know, to be straight out and honest, obviously for us it was something that, um, yeah, not it's not a proud part of my journey, it's an interesting part. And I look back and as much as um, I would have definitely used the business skills that I had and acquired now to do what I do because I still did at that military level with my business now um, to get great outcomes. What if I um, had applied it elsewhere? Yeah, uh, and it's something that you. Well, they say on. that like a lot of criminals have got an entrepreneurial mindset, right? Absolutely, because they're effectively what they're doing is a form of hustle, which is which if they channeled, if they had the right role models, and they channeled it in the right direction, Huge. they could turn it into, I don't know, like any any business. Like, and there's a lot of people out there <clears throat> doing great things that are going through that world at the moment. Mm. Um, because they do, they have that hustle, you know, like to listen to a police scanner and understand the conversation, the codes, like, as you said, it's military planning because in the end, you run out of that bank, in our last bank robbery, they watched us, the police watched us rob that bank. Mm. And we came out and there's a car up on the gutter, just a citizen who's driven up, tried to block the doors of the bank. I, doors open, I literally felt like it was a movie. I ran and just slid across the bonnet. Um, bang, jumped in the car, and now we're getting chased by this motorbike copper. And this motorbike copper, in general, um, undercover surveillance unit, they're, they're chasing us. I'm telling him he's a police officer. Um, and for us, obviously, with them, they set up to the point where same surveillance teams, you know, you're always dealing with major crime squad. And um, for us, they had a whole team. The pole air is out, dog squad, SOGs in Melbourne, which is like the blokes that take you down and they're all set up in another bank that we'd looked at and last moment they've realized we're at this other bank mm -hmm. they're all scrambling and we rob this bank and get away um and that you know it's, it's not by luck it's basically the fact that we had planned so well and uh as i said if you can use that same skill that same grit that same determination what are the words behind it commitment perseverance whatever you want discipline mm -hmm. and put that into the right pathway which i did now that's a great um great way to sort of transition out of who I used to be to who I am today. How did you get caught? Uh, we were unfortunately being watched. I wasn't. Someone else was being watched at the, at the time. They were dealing a bunch of drugs. Those um, police officers from New South Wales had let Victoria know. They watched us thinking a drug deal or something of that nature was going to go down. They come to the hotel. Any blokes from New South Wales, we'd lost them at one point in time. They find a, there's one bloke here from New South Wales that might fit the description. His name's this, it didn't match who they were looking for. Just look at the ID and they knew the picture and they sent it back to New South Wales and the rest was history. Surveillance started, so they watched us pretty much that plan that whole week leading up to it. I got onto them at one stage and said to the boys, mate, I think we're under surveillance. We've seen a car three separate occasions three different locations told them to pull the plug on that and at that point in time um i said you know we're going to get done for the car you mm. do six months or something and for us doing so long six months to me was nothing um it was easy i'd rather do that than get busted for the bank or even get shot out the front of the bank and um unfortunately the um, crew were probably too confident and to you got know, to the point where it was going a bit too easy yeah and they just said that don't worry we'll be right you're tripping out and um once we got chased by that motorbike copper after the bank i realized mate no we were under surveillance that bloke rode too well he's either a racing motorbike racing you know um rider or he's a police officer and sure enough he was later on getting caught blessing in disguise biggest thing that could and getting caught in melbourne because two different systems. Sydney system is battle mode. Like you come out to the yard and you're, it's gladiator, you're in the Colosseum. I'm not joking when I say that. You go out and it could be your last day today. Just 
you and even more so depending on race even your own race you know if they feel that you're talking to somebody in the wrong way for too long what's going on here and mm. people start to ask questions people start to conversate chinese whispers a lot of power struggles and man it's easy for someone to walk up and do whatever victoria um, computers in the cells swimming pools um, there was units where you sit down and you get these big knives where you're actually cooking dinners, ordering your foods for the whole unit. More trust. Yeah, and it just sort of built. I was at that point where I'd done a lot. Some of all my efforts, I always talked about that in other podcasts. Study here, book there, conversation here. And it just transitioned at that point in time. I think if I got locked up in Sydney, I might have kept going, yeah. to be straight out and honest with you. Was there anyone in the prison that was um, in law enforcement or anything like that that kind of, I don't know, took a sort of liking to you and, and gave you a bit of support and a bit of hope for the outside? Um, I suppose like a lot of officers would say stuff to me and say, do you realise you've got a good skill? And I was like, what do you mean? And they said, mate, you're a very effective communicator. You've made your unit, the jail, the boys get on with one another. And I think, yeah, I used to ask the boys, like, and no disrespect to the to anybody and, and don't take this out of context, but we're in the criminal world at that point in time and I'm, they want to fight me because of, it, you know, or the race, you're a different race, I'm a different race, so let's punch on and I'm boss, you're not that mm. sort, of, sort of mentality and I said mm. mate did you ever punch on with the officers that arrested you and they're like no I said so you want to fight me but you don't want to fight who's who's the enemy so I'd yeah, ask them that yeah, yeah. and it, it made me realise that I'd ask questions to people to help them bring a light bulb moment to mm. themselves and some of these people had very and I mean this in a nice way limited skills other than the violence that they brought to the table and, yeah. and that's what help them survive I think a lot of that's motivated by fear as well like I I remember being quite young and angry absolutely until about the age of maybe 19 when I joined the Marines and they used to do this thing called controlled aggression when to switch it on when to switch it off good times to do it bad times to do it um and I, you know, I'd be the first person, uh, 50 Cent actually says this best. He goes, he goes, uh, I haven't got a problem with anyone, but if you've got a problem, no problem. Yeah. And I used to be like that. So yeah. I would be like in a bar, not causing anyone issues. Guy bumps past me. He turns around, gets a bit aggressive, whatever. I'm happy. Like, mm. Let's do it. Like, mm. I'm keen. Like, yeah. do you know what I mean? That was, that was used to be my mentality. Instead of going, oh, sorry, mate, and carrying on with my Absolutely. evening, my evening used to be, if the guy says something to me first, well, I'm not going to back down now. Yeah. Um, because they look at it as, as uh, well, I used to look at it as a form of weakness. Absolutely. But really, it was motivated by fear because I thought, shit, if this guy gets the upper hand first, you know, I'm in a, I'm in a bad situation then, so I want to have the upper hand first. So yeah. I'd get aggressive you know, Absolutely. back. And um, <clears throat> it's, the com- it's the wrong way of doing it. Uh, because when I joined the Marines, you had, they, they built you to such a high level of confidence, fitness, you know, at the end of the day, you had rounds all around your body. You yeah. know, you, you had the ability to, to take lives at the end of the day. And um, when you went out after that on a night out, you know, someone brushes past you and kicks Chest off. I'm out. like, <laughs> easy money. Yeah, but we, we, my mentality switched then because yeah. I was like, well, I know what I can do to you. Absolutely. So I'm just going to walk away. Like, good yeah, luck yeah. with your evening, you know, type of thing. I was more interested in the women in the bar rather it. than dealing with the guy, you know, some g- guy kicking off. I was but like yourself. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'd ne- we it did well for both of us. <laughs> tight, tight crew, tight <laughs> neighbourhood. And, well, yeah, especially King's Cross was crazy back then. Yeah. Everyone was punching on everywhere. And a lot of people knew Redfin and, and uh, they knew how violent Redfin can be. So mm. we'd go to a club and we'd just have a good night and people loved us there especially bars because we'd actually bring a lot of money to the club everyone would be having a good time mm. we didn't ever want to fight anybody but if you brought if you wanted the drama yeah. uh, like we we're going to just turn the place upside down and and then free outside and do some more out there and it happened more often than not yeah because uh, of the day and age back then i suppose and, and but same thing i just went out every single night to just enjoy myself and um yeah, just crazy times. Like, <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Then I'd have mates that I'd walk in. We walked into an <clears throat> Islander bar. 
I think it was called oh, I'm, I'm, I can't, it was called something I remember it but he, he, he walks in it's him and I there's a whole bunch of Islanders bloke's got a beer he grabs a beer he says thanks mate and skulls his beer and when you knew yeah right yeah, yeah. yeah like just crazy stuff looking like back that. on it you're like stupid why did I do and that and I <clears throat> then I bar that person I'm like man I just don't need that you know yeah, I, yeah. I don't mind the battle but at the same time save the battle for when you need it and uh, mm. different conversation and uh, uh, that built strength into me as an individual and a leader for myself before we get into all the good bits that you're doing now you know all across Australia in places like Dubai and all the rest of it what's a couple of things that people might not know about you <sighs> all right I'll give you a couple uh, as a young kid um, I was very young at the time father was a baker um, he had <laughs> and I think back to it now and I look back to it um, I woke up one morning and um, his partner had been stabbed um, to death next to me and you know I, to, like, I was literally next to the body and just freaked out ran out on the streets just screaming around and I was yeah it was, I was at an age probably I can't even remember and I've asked people um, how did that how did that happen her ex-boyfriend apparently come to the house and obviously done something. I think he, I'm pretty sure he got arrested for it. But I never really looked into it until recently. I was like, oh man, I just that, now I remember that. And I, and he, and I think to myself, my dad had some great choices for whatever reason. But he, another girlfriend had committed suicide um, with some sleeping tablets. Same thing, and I woke up next to her. So. And I, man, I wouldn't, so have, seen, I wouldn't have been past 12 at that stage. You'd seen death already yeah. at, the, at, the, at the most severe level. And, and I think what, <clears throat> I'm not think, he'd go to, he was a baker, couldn't get a babysitter. I'd sit in this one room, literally that was our house, whatever you want to call it. It was at the back of a um, place down in Redfern Street, Redfern, it was just a room. And I'd sit there so scared after those events that it was dark and I'd literally picture a monster, a shadow, a person, a head, like mm. to that point where, and that was day in, day out, relentlessly, um, until I fell asleep. So I'd be sitting going, I'm ready to go, I'm ready to go. And then I'd run down this little hallway thing out the front of the house, it was a Lebanese family, um, screaming and she'd get me and, and long, uh, crazy story. Year, fast forward years later, I come home talking to a um, bloke who's um, done some stuff for Ninja Warrior, he, he was well known. And I said, but um, when I was a kid, I lived in the back of this house. There was an old lady that brought me up really. And he said, I wonder if she still is there, she'd knock on the door. So I knock on the door and she comes out and I'm like, oh, he goes, reckon it's her? And I'm trying to talk to her, she can't speak. Um, and it, we sort of get in a conversation. I used to live here, I was trying to tell her that she couldn't speak English. And she looks at me, she goes, Jeffrey? And I was like, yes, Jeffrey. And we were tripping out, we tripped out, so she's still alive. And I went past um, just probably a couple of weeks ago to say hello again, but they'd moved her into a nursing home or something. So um, if anyone's out there listening to this and that's your mother or grandmother or something, let us know where she is, because I'd love to say, um, I don't know, she did so much for me as a kid. And I, I've looked back on a lot of people now that did so much and instilled she, you know, her nurturing nature, her beauty. Uh, we didn't. She obviously didn't speak English, but was able to make sure that I was okay and bring calmness and and yeah, a genuine shift in who I was as a person, I suppose. And you got to be grateful for that stuff before she does die. And so, if you're out there, that's your grandmother, your mother. Hit me up, um, drop into my inbox, and um, I'd love to go and visit. Wow, that's. Um that's some heavy stuff, like <laughs> right. And that was before I even got the twelve and jumped, <coughs> and jumped out the window. Jeez, <laughs> that is insane. Yeah. It's um. I was thinking about this the other day. I was just like, I haven't even never spoken about this. And then I started <laughs> thinking whether my dad was crazy or not, and mm. it was him that had done stuff. Because as far as I knew, uh, um, it was everything he told me. But he never got locked up, so. Obviously, um, I'm pretty sure you know, um, in both cases it was what it was. Um, police would have mm. investigated, and yeah, That's, it's wild. It's Insane. it's um, 
it's funny that you say about your neighbor helping you out when you're like running down the you know the corridor or whatever and she's trying to help you out i find that in poorer communities the community is better uh, it's the bonding it's more like you talk to your neighbors and everyone knows so and so and you know someone's parents and you can go around and knock on the door and the, the door's always open um and then it's as so you kind of move into these <coughs> suburbs where people are more affluent you know, I've moved recently moved into Willoughby. I've I've seen my neighbours on a number of occasions. I've tried to say hello to one of them. Mm. I don't know how many times, and they don't even look at you. Yeah, it's and crazy, it's just yeah. a strange like it's odd because I'm like a people person. I like talking to people, like, you know. And I, and I grew up on like a what we would call a council estate back home, which oh, is like yeah, um, yeah. I don't know what do they call it in Australia. The same sort of yeah, thing. Like so it, yeah, so like housing you know, commission, housing commissions housing and stuff like that. Yeah. And, and I knew everyone. Yeah, like you yeah, knew yeah. everyone in the community. Yeah, you know, good or bad, like it didn't matter. But you at least you all knew each other. Yeah, and yeah, you might have your rifts between each other. But if the community came together and did stuff, it's. I think it's quite sad now that we don't have... Well, we have less of it, I suppose. In, That's in, crazy, in, in yeah. Certain, That's so true. Yeah. Oh, we grew up, where we grew up in Everly Street, Redfern, no one... Taxi drivers wouldn't come there. Police didn't want to come there. We were just our own... Yeah, you know, we'd do our own thing. And I could walk into any house and I'd, say, I'd just say, I'm just going to make a sandwich. They'd yeah. be like, yeah, sweet. And you know what? We didn't have much. We had 20 bucks worth of food in the fridge, but they'd say... Mm. Go, go for it. You know, go make it, son. Or and well, they'd make you something. Yeah, or they'd make it. You know, I've got some stew here or something of that nature, and it, it wasn't much. And you know, you get the bread with the butter and just load up, and that was us, man. But the the bond and the unity between people, and I think in this day and age, that's disappeared. You know, the connection. We just don't connect anymore. People can't even connect with themselves. They jump on social media, spend three seconds, and scroll to the next thing. That lesson could become a blessing within your life and i challenge everybody that watches this watch a video and watch it to the end and then say to yourself what's the lesson that becomes my blessing how do i grow from it and now how do i prosper and when you do that you challenge how your mind operates because now people just go chum, 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 and that's i call it a fast-paced society we literally or drive lack through society of, complete lack of meaningful connections man <clears throat> uh, you you say hello to me i'm like who do F are you, man. What are you saying? Yeah. Oh, do you want to rob me? What's oh, what's yeah. that bloke's problem? And it's just. Can you blown. imagine saying hello to someone on the train going into the sea? <laughs> hello, mate. You're right. How's your day going? They'd be like, what the "Fuck, are you going to rob me? What, what's going on?" <laughs> ah, who are you, man? Yeah, just saying hello. And, and I just think, <clears throat> I think even he, between here, Australia, and Europe, like you could be in Europe and it's just a different attitude and mentality. And you know, you do. You go through community. Then I go to Egypt. Recently, you see the pyramids and same thing, the unity between the people there. Mm. They, you know, we, they, uh, same thing for us, the gratitude for the simplest things. Mm. You know, you give me a piece of bread, that was like $100,000 to you because you got nothing, but you're giving me something. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, you know what, I value our friendship and our connection. Man, my door's open and I don't have much, but you know what, what I have is yours as well. And uh, I, yeah, imagine the world was like that in this current space. Yeah, I I um I totally agree with you. I have um uh, I find in Australia, um I'm hoping that some of the stuff that's going on in the world gives Australia people that li have lived in Australia and maybe forgotten how good they've got it, gives them a bit of like, like it just it blows my mind that people aren't striving to do better for themselves when they live in a country like this um we it doesn't matter it. where your background is or where you like come from it, it's you've got you've got a roof over your head you've got clean clothes you've got um food on the table you get to sit on a toilet you mm. get to turn the tap on and you've got clean water Absolutely. and it just That's fucking blows my mind that people don't appreciate it um you know everyone's complaining uh, some of the crap that, that you see on the news that Oh, you know, Optus went out today. I'm like, oh, maybe you might talk to your neighbour. You know, like, do you know what I mean? Like you might, you might come out and go, oh, is your internet on? Oh, <laughs> that's the first time I spoke to you in the last three weeks. What's your name? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Who are you? I know you've lived across the road for a little while. What's but your pet's name? It's like, God, the internet went out. Pff, who cares? First world problems. Do you know what I mean? We focus, as humans, we've got the mentality in this day and age now to focus on the problem. Why? Because we're in a pub setting as an example. 
come and sit down. Oh, you know, let me tell you about my girlfriend. Let me tell you about my boyfriend. I'll sit with the boys. They sit with the girls. And instead of me and you as a partner, we were in a partnership um, relationship, I should say, you and I sitting down having this conversation, we take it out to the world. Now, all the girls are judging you and all the boys are judging me as the girl, right? So because – and they don't know the context to that conversation. And yeah, there's I two to sides people, to every truth. If you're going to have any conversation about anybody, firstly, if you're going to open your, your mouth about somebody, make sure it's positive or it's about a solution that you can bring to the problem that they've got. Because if you're talking about this person saying, this bloke's no good, what is it? he's a wreck well then you must have the solution to the problem mm. but you want the world to be a better place but you won't sit down with that person and pass on the solution it's insane mm. and then we sit in a society now where i'm going to judge you because you cheated on your partner how about i sit down as a man and say what are your values what are your morals what's respect mm. mean to you and, and start to build that into somebody because it's easy to judge somebody on something that they don't know what you know how to do it or how to apply themselves to it uh, but once they've got that information, and even then, you've got to take them through the process of building the habit and ritual. Easier to say, I'm going to lose weight, Jen, first. The, the application to yeah, that, do to it. succeed mm. through mm. that whole process. And that's where if we understand it as humans, we can start to say, look, I'm going to be patient with this individual. I'm going to build some stuff into him and teach him things. And that's, you know, those interactions with the older lady, people, my father, over time, the sum of all efforts became those little bits that they build into me and that's what you mm. see before yourself today it's funny i don't like um i find that we're we're moving through a time where there's a battle of being able to have these honest conversations with people oh. and you're uh, like for me i'm uh, i'm an extremely honest person so i don't care if you're my best mate or i've just met you i'm gonna tell you so and it, and it and it's and I, it's not coming from a place of hate or dislike. It's coming from a place of love. Like, I want yes. you to do better as a person. So, you know, if you're smoking too much weed and you come and tell me that you're anxious and you're having problems and your relationships aren't going well, then I'm going to tell you to stop fucking smoking weed. 100. And I'm going to be the only bloke out of our friend group that's going to tell you and sit you down and take you for dinner and pay for it and be like, you're being a fucking idiot. Like, sort yourself yes. out. But it's... We're going through this... That. We're going through this... Um, time where um everything's a bit um there's no there's no deep and meaningful then there's no honest conversation uh, yes. and, and and we're we're watching news headlines and everything's polarizing and there's not enough depth to the com i mean i'm glad Yeesh. the podcast is starting to come out and things like that and but i do i do fear that people are just surface level and they're yeah. not they're not getting to the root cause of we run know, what's through going life on. <clears throat> on just the scope of what if I ask most people what happens in life. Tell me your life journey. I'm mm. born, I go to school, I go to uni, I get a part-time job, buy a house, maybe buy a nice car, travel here and there to some places if mm. I've got some money, have the two kids, hopefully boy, girl. What is the... And that will be the ideal life. And then they'll look through the lens of somebody else who's travelling more often than not, maybe in business class, living a different way. How come you're so happy? People think I'm on, well, I don't know, some form of drug from because I'm so happy mm. but I've tapped into gratitude I've understood that we live in a beautiful country mm. go to another country you've got to sit in the ground and, and go to the toilet mm. different conversation go to jail and you've got to go to the toilet in front of yourself different conversation now I'm grateful but we grow up with this mentality where the programming of an individual is pretty bare minimum and but they'll think so many people will go to the grave with regrets they live in the prison of their own mindset mm. all their life they're born you know they can die when they're 20 and die um they you know they let me rephrase that they die when they're 20 but they actually get buried at 75 or, or onwards and, yeah. and that to me is what most people do i wish i could do that what can't why can't you do that and it's only your thought process, self-limiting thoughts, babies and beliefs that have been instilled in yourself from past experiences, partners, environments, workplaces, teammates and so forth. And you get to a point, as I said before, where all these people, when you're a young age, by the time you're at uni, you've been shut down by your parents, your partner, maybe your school teacher, your work first workplace. No wonder we're built with these habits where, oh, should I do it? Should I not do it? Should... Just do it. Get out Just there. Do it, yeah. Have a crack. <clears throat> 
And the depth perception on that conversation is what stops people. Oh, he's doing that. He's been doing that podcast for 10 years. That's why he's saying, well, the first podcast had three views. Mm. His next, you know, 10 years later, it's got 3 million views. The depth perception of I can't keep up with Joe Rogan is crazy. Yeah, it's Just mad, be yeah. you. <clears throat> and what mm. happens with the podcast happens. And mm. as long as you're loving your life, then you're living your life. And people always fake it. And, and, you know, to me, they become the bank robber. They pull the mask on every single day. They walk out the door and go, ah, ha, ha, hi, I'm so happy. And then go, oh, I wish I went on that holiday like him. I wish I could fly a business car. How do I drive yeah. that car? Well, all you have to do is step into your passion, whatever that may be. Give that some time, energy and effort. Put a set aside um, half an hour just like you do for your Netflix or the bullshit that you feed yourself every day and step into it and same principle as you people might go oh this bloke's hating on me I want you to live with the passion and love the happiness the kindness the empathy that I have within the space for my own life to live that life of elevation every single day and the idea is continuously working towards that penthouse I'm not just going to settle for the ground for run of the mill life 100% and you know you always hear about is could your life be a movie I, I'm on channel 10 the other day go on that interview and Stevie Jacobs says to me your life could be a movie that's I don't have to tell he told me that he told right? you that yeah and, and he would maybe if he watches he, he'd say the same thing I did say that right because that's what I've created with my life and I'd say to every single person, go out and live the greatest version of yourself. Write it out, even if it looks so crazy and you aim this high, but you get to this height, tell mm. me that's not going to be a good life. It's going to be a magical one. And it's definitely not a run-of-the-mill life. It's mad because um, I, I'll i watch, um, well, I've witnessed and watched friends of mine, people that I grew up with going through school, and you know, I've had a pretty, like if I look back on it, you know, I joined the Marines when I was 18. I've been to places like Djibouti, Saudi, Jordan, Crazy. Azerbaijan. Um, I've been on shooting packages with America. I've been to Norway. I've been mountain training in Scotland. I've done a whole heap of shit before I was 23. Wow. But all in that time as well, I learned in, to appreciate getting back out of the field and sitting on a toilet and getting in a bath and all the, all the silly little things that you all take Crazy, for granted. Yeah. But I sit there and I'm like, like all of these people that, go to university um, and they're, they're going to do degrees that have has nothing in line with anything that they're interested in. Crazy. They're just doing it to fill this void because they're not sure. And the amount of times I say to people, if you don't know what you're going to do, just go traveling or Travel, take a year, a right, spend the 25000 that it's going to cost you to go around the world for a year. You can pay it off for the next 60 years, you know, like whatever. Just go and go and make some memories, get some stories, get some perspective on the world. Get out of Absolutely. your small, like your small town mentality and try something different. And if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. You can always come home. It's always there, you know, like I, when I when I um, left the Marines, I had an operation on the Friday because they had to fix me yeah. before I left. And I had a hernia injury that had been reoccurring wow. and the they said to me, don't fly. And the next day I got a one-way <laughs> ticket <laughs> and I had, had my, had both of my bags okay, with me. Fly. Yeah, I won't fly. And then I walked out the door, <clears throat> got to the Plymouth train station, had both my bags. And I was like trying to put the bag onto the, you know, Couldn't you know, the step, yeah. the gap between yeah. the thing. This guy could see me. And I was like, mate, I've just had an operation yesterday. Can you help me with my bag? So yeah. he helped me with my bag, and I went straight and I got a one-way ticket. You wow. know, and I and I and I landed there and I got a job like two weeks in, and I ended up staying there for four years, and it was an amazing experience, and I learned a lot, and I I did a lot of cool stuff. I trained celebrities like Supercar Blondie, Love that. and 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 started a business and tried and failed, and 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 it just tried and learned, tried and learned, yeah, tried and learned, and. And um, it's 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 nuts to me that people live mediocre, mundane lives that aren't fulfilling themselves. I'll you know? tell you, I'll give you a great example. I was just thinking about that when you were talking. You get a flat tire and you you, ha you you don't have much money, right? You might even be near broke. And the tire replacement tire was whatever it is, right? You need you go there and they go, you actually need four, and it's four hundred bucks even, and you got fifty bucks in the account. Do you make it happen? 
even if it's borrowing from somebody, right? Yeah. You borrow it and then you get the money and you make it back. Well, if you can do it, it shows that once it's prioritized enough for yourself, mm -hmm. you'll do it. So I seen a great video the other day saying if I kidnap your family and I said, here's 50,000 ransom and you didn't have the money and I said, mate, you'd any place way, get yeah. involved, they're gone. Mm. You'd find a way. Because your family would be your heart and soul, right? You'd do anything and everything. You'd go out and make it happen. If you do that every single day like I did as a 12-year-old kid, you try and get in the way of me getting my salt and vinegar chips, you're getting done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For like a dollar, probably a dollar back then. <laughs> but like you've got to understand it's just a mentality you take into it. And if I can make $1, so aim to make $1 mm. a different way than your current run-of-the-mill way. And if you can make one, then you can make ten. If you can make ten, you can make a hundred. Mm -hmm. Make a hundred thousand, thousand, hundred thousand, hundred thousand million. And when you take that mentality into life, now I don't just go, get up and go, oh, you know, I've got plenty of money now, or life's good, I'm going to lay here. I've still got, similar to yourself, the discipline to make my bed in the morning. Why, why do I? I'll pay somebody else. No, I'm going to do it myself because the discipline of being disciplined towards life, that skill goes into another set of life, my relationship, my business, my health, whatever it may be. And then now I'm operating at that level and all it takes is just one effort, one second, one moment, one choice, but we overthink it and we go into this mentality, oh, you know, Joe Rogan's got, I'm never going to be like him. Yeah. I, I don't One step at a time. You know, <clears throat> just put it out there, man. And mm. if you've got magic within yourself and the magic is the passion of what you have for to a, you know, a field, an element or, or way of life, share that with the world and watch what happens. Everyone that's ever done that, whether it's in sport, Mike Tyson, whether it's in business, Tony Robbins, whether... In these elements, people then step into that space and say, I've got a passion and it shines to the world. You don't have to tell people. I've got to people and they say, Mools, man, I love watching your life through social media. Well, why do you like watching it? What do you like watching about it? And they said, oh, you know, I wish I could do that. And I said, what's the difference you between you and I? Too. Can I ask you that? I'll put them on the spot because... It's not me being a prick. I want you to live that too and I want you to change your mentality that I only make 1500 a week so I can't do what you do. Well, that's your mentality around what you're currently doing with this time frame. What if you dropped off one of those days and dedicated towards the passion of the business of your life and what you love doing? What would happen within a year from now? I guarantee you'd be at a point where you're making, even if it was 500 bucks a week, right? As an example, times 52, 25 grand. What are you going to do with 25 grand or 27 grand? Mm. But what would you do with that? Um, and in general, oh, some in and around that. But in general, maybe that's your business class flights to Europe and back just to travel a different way. And once you do that, now you're like, I don't ever want to fly economy again. Not because it's a knock on economy, but because you've now experienced something that you've never seen before. And now you start to become who you actually want to be because you know that there's more to life than the run of the mill. And I used to pay for a membership in Dubai called the Privilege Pass. Privilege Pass. And it was, um, <clears throat> it was quite expensive. Yeah. And it gave me access to every five-star hotel in Dubai. Love and I that. could use the beach, I could use the pool, I could use the sauna, I could use the gym and everything else. How good. But I did that because I wanted a taste of that life. Love that. A fraction of the cost. Beautiful. Right? And it, but what it did was it motivated me because I'd turn up at the valet and I had my rental car, which was a little Ford KA. Yeah. Little rental car, like, you know. Anyone that anyone that wasn't doing that well had one of these rental cars because you could go straight to you could go straight to national I think it was national car rentals or something like that and you could get the for, and everyone Cheap. that landed in Dubai went straight there because you couldn't get financed <laughs> straight away right so I turn up there you get free valet yeah they're like sir come out and they're like hopping in the guy behind me is in his Ferrari oh, I know. and I'd roll down Everywhere. to the gym and I'd just surround myself with all these people and 100%. just sit there and go. Like, God, if I could just get a slight... But then you start talking to those people and you start hanging around those people. It's like that saying, show me your friends, I'll show you your future. 100%. And, and I was always just trying to be around people that were slightly more successful or hugely more successful than me. Um, and it allowed me to be able... It allowed me the understanding that these people are just normal people. Absolutely. And and they've they've most of them have come from you know humble upbringings and they've all made it themselves. 
uh, and and there's there's no excuse. Like I need to I need to put myself out there more. You I need heard to any one of those say, no, nah, <laughs> I don't want you to win. I'm not going to share that advice with you. No, yourself. they tell you everything. Hundred percent, they do. And they bring you along with them as well. And, and so when I share this, people, mm. I get comments of, oh, you think you're better than me? I want you to win with me. Yeah. We're stacking wins together. Yeah. And the funniest thing over time, as you've just said, mm. that circle. Uh, the, so a whole bunch of clients, coaching clients, have become millionaires in Dubai, and I go over there and now. We're doing business together over there, as an example. Property mm-hmm. development over there, different conversations because proximity to me helped them get to a position, and now they say, "Hey, come back into the fold and let's do something together." And that's what happens. So I'll sit in a space. It's how I became a global business, to be straight out and honest. On a flight to um, Dubai, we're having conversations with just people in business class. They got the bar and Emirates. You can literally drink your way over. I'm not a fan of it, like, <laughs> but I'll mingle there. Um, and loose link, lips um, sink, sink ships. ships yeah, but while they had a few drinks mm. in them, mate, they were more than everyone. I shared, they shared. What about this? You thought about that. What about... And it could be the simplest thing that just plugs into your business. And I said, hey, do you know that this thing, this thing, and that thing for me allowed my business to then connect to that person. They said, we actually know the person and who looks after all of the Australians overseas. Bang, had a conversation. Now let's go and talk to these businesses, Australian um, citizens that have started businesses overseas, create leadership and well-being in this space. Mm-hmm. And now that's a, a different journey. And that proximity you spoke about shows you that, you know, when I was hanging around Redfin every single day, we'd hang out at the top, someone would walk down, hey, do you want to go rob a bank? We had our own crew, but in general, they'd just get together and walk out and... You know, like someone going to get a coffee and it was insane. But the proximity meant that we also were pro- close to jail as well. Mm. And the same principle now. Now I'm around business. I've just got to make sure that I'm in a space where someone's not running dodgy business and I'm in the right space where we can all elevate together, stack wins, and we're all a team, man. It's motivating to move to places that are doing uh, incredible things because... Um, I'm from a little town back in the UK. It's there's you know the nearest city is a 20 minute drive through the countryside, and my town there's Love not that. a lot going on. Right, half the shops are shut down on the high street. It's oh, just wow. betting shops and bloody you know what um, charity news shops agent. and whatever news agents and yeah. stuff. And no one's really no, no one's driving around in Rolls Royces and Bentleys yeah. and blah blah blah. But um, when you move to a, a any sort of city like Dubai, London, Sydney, um, parts of Sydney, um, part, parts of London, but Dubai as a whole is is a um, extremely motivating place to want to get your shit done, right? Um, Big time. And you turn up there and you see the lights and you think, Phew, like this is, you know, I, I can make, I might be able to make myself something of here, um, and it and it's just all it all all that is is literally just moving yourself from one destination to another it could be you grew up in the wrong suburb in sydney Absolutely. and then you move to bondi and then Absolutely. you move to the northern beaches or you you went and spoke to um you know the finance gurus in the city or whatever it was and then suddenly these doors start to open because you're hanging around with the right people they're sharing their knowledge with you you're getting motivated by that Absolutely. knowledge and you think yep yeah, actually i can do it and it and it you you soon realize that most business plans start from a conversation at a pub or at a restaurant or on a flight and it's written down on a napkin or put in (laughs) your put in your iphone notes and it's not this big like you know esoteric thing that you can't achieve like everyone's doing it the same way like there i remember i'd rather um, learn on the way than not learn at all 100 percent. and and uh you know i i look back on People say to me, "How did you manage to train Supercar Blondie? She's the, one of the highest-paid marketing influencers on the planet, and she uh, has a Facebook page which is the number one on the planet, second to Lab Bible. Wow. Like it's, you know, she's ridiculously you know successful. What it is. You brought value to the table around yeah. what you do. And I sat there and I was like." If I message 100 people, one of them's going to message me back. 100%. And but she well, messaged me back. She's like, yeah, you can train me. I was like, I'll tr- what? What? You know, like, bang, bang. Like, there's my opportunity. That's my it's marketing funny. strategy, That's, you know? You asked me about something um, that I, not many people know. When I was, I'd just come home and I don't, even she wouldn't know, but Brooke Evers um, is a DJ that done well here in Australia and then overseas as well. And 
Um, Brookie, uh, when I was, I don't know, I don't, I don't even know what uh, Brookie you can tell me. I know a brother as well. I've trained with brother Ryan. He's an absolute animal as well. But in general, she reached out. We had a conversation. You want to train me? Hell yeah. And um, she was doing some modeling stuff. She was a DJ, international DJ. And like, it's the, whatever you're putting out to the world around your passion. And at that point in time, I was flipping through the air. I was doing all this stuff with the training side of things and proximity to that space of the people say man i want to know what you're doing and uh to me yeah it's it's most people don't believe in themselves and they think that you know someone's beyond their reach and i look through some i literally look through my feed to the other day i hadn't been on facebook much i just post an instant it goes across to facebook oh, i better get on the facebook and start to actually have a look and Facebook's done really well for me. I hadn't even realised, but I started looking, and the people that are in my friends' suggestions are celebrities and people. And I'm like, proximity-wise, I'm starting to shift who I've got in my space. Mm, mm. And, I, and yeah, it's not me wanting to... I'll never forget where I came from, but it's also I don't want just an average life. I want to walk away, and I want everybody to think like this. I say, write out your ideal life, have a look at the ideal life, <laughs> And then say, is it what I'm truly living? And if your ideal life has you jumping out of aeroplanes, finding inner peace, watching the sun come up every day, having money go into your bank account, driving the Ferrari, Lamborghini, in Dubai, whatever it is, right, but you're not currently doing it, then why aren't you doing it? And what's the ste steps to start the transition? Mm. And then people can really sit down and go, you know what? If I was to say, write out, we want to write out a movie, tell me each scene and we want to bring the magic to the screen... And you go, oh, I woke up and went to bed every day. Look, if that really lights you up and you get up and you're bouncing out of bed and you're jumping, doing backflips with your kids and all of the above, right, every day, and that's like that relentlessly, great. For me, I'm aiming to literally bounce out of bed and bounce into life every single day. because I, And I'm trying to highlight real that because I just I want to enjoy life. Some people just don't get... This current day and age with the, the wars that are going on, some people never even got past, you know, being a young child. And we're here and we're just saying we, we've become prisoners of our own mindset and let's piss the opportunity up the wall of, you know, life that we actually get. Use those 86,400 seconds every single day, go up and show up to the life and the movie that you want to create around the highlight reels of that movie. And the creator, the writer, the director, the actor is you and until you realize that and not give a fuck about what anyone else says mm. then you're never going to step into the greatest version of yourself i'm pumped i'm pumped Let's are you go. pumped <laughs> <Ow>. <laughs> i'm gonna end on this let let's say uh, I'm, I'm talking about a young man right now who might be displaced doesn't have a role model um maybe they're just coming up to the point where they can leave home and uh, they're at that I don't know, 16 to 18 to 21 sort of age and they're, they're not quite sure <clears throat> where their direction goes and they're listening to this podcast right now. What do you say to that individual? How do they nav navigate the next three years to better themselves? Everything's a lesson. What you go through, you grow through. So um, it's important. We perceive things as a problem. And why did it happen to me? It didn't happen to you, it happened for you. So, and that's a different perception. And most people do this, something happens, oh, you know, my girlfriend left me, my job fired me, I haven't got money. And I'll tell you, I'll tell the next person, I'll tell our group, and we're all sitting around moping and grinding about what we can't change, rather than focusing on what's the solution to your problem. So every young kid or every person on this planet, as soon as something happens to me, I let you say, what's the solution to this problem? little diagram out here can i fix it yes i can create the solution step into that as a lesson grow prosper and if i can't i literally like you can't save the world i'd love to save move every on. homeless person mm. but i yeah unless i'm going to move into that space and become a advocate for the homeless then I, and, and even then i'm not going to save the world i can only do what i can do take every lesson as a blessing and shift your mentality create a better reality see things as a lesson that become a blessing within your life Amazing. How do people get hold of you? How do they get hold of your programs and touch? Maybe there's a company watching that wants you to come over and do some, do a workshop with them. Um, JeffreyMorgan.com.au. J-E-F-F-R-E-Y. 
And um, I don't know why, but everyone calls me Jeremy. <laughs> I swear, I get it all the time. And they're like, see, Jeremy. And I'm like, and, and I'm so, like, I'm just He's me. Like, I'm yeah, like, mate. Yeah, mate. <laughs> Check ya. And, uh, yeah, it's, uh, what you know, what do you do? You should buy the domain, Jeremy. <laughs> mate, I know, you jeremy.com.au. Yeah, yeah, to, to, to turn it up. But I don't know, jeffreymorgan.com.au. So Perfect, reach out, awesome. have a conversation. Um, we deal with school kids, elders, corporates, soldiers, athletes. Anyone want a high performance in your life, your mindset, your well-being, um, mental health, uh, obviously suicide prevention, um, losing a brother and sister to suicide. So, mate, by all means, um, reach out, have that conversation. <laughs> and then when I say our program changes and saves lives, it's not about just trauma and abuse. It's about you getting the most out of life. And people go, I am. I sit with any individual and within five minutes, they're like, oh, shit. You know what? I can get so much more out of my life, mm. and then we start to create that roadmap framework towards the greatest version of yourself, designed by you, guided by me, and let's roll out. Amazing, awesome. We'll put all the details down in the comments. Please like and subscribe to the channel if you enjoyed it. If you've got comments about it, get in the box and start chatting about it. Cheers, mate. Thank you very much. Ledge. <laughs>